I'm Jessica Tovar. I work for the local Clean Energy Alliance, as done my, my friend here, Angela Scott. <laughs> and um, I actually used to be a community organizer here in Richmond. Um, so I did a lot of work against the Chevron oil refinery expansion between 2006 uh, and 2012. Um, so it's very interesting to be back because when I was organizing around the refinery, it was very unpopular to do work around the refinery, so it was very hard. It's very burned out, very burned out. <laughs> so now with the Local Clean Energy Alliance, I'm in a good place where I'm talking about more about the solutions, um, but still addressing like all the same issues of env environmental injustice, environmental racism, and climate um, injustice. So I'm really glad that I'm doing this work because it's relative. Um, and it's also very important for us to really be aggressive with pushing for um, clean energy solutions and actually put this infrastructure in place to replace the old and dirty model. So we call that the just transition, right? So I work with the local Clean Energy Alliance um, and the work I do, I call clean power to the people because what we're really trying to do is make this um, the norm clean energy the norm, right? Um, but also, we, we, you know, we live in a capitalist society where if you have the money, you own your home or you own your business, you can slap on some solar panels, you're good, um, and you can tell your friends all the thing, good things you're doing for the environment with clean energy, but at the end of the day, the majority of us can't do that. Um, so I'm really, really trying to think about ways that uh, everybody could benefit from clean energy um, and how we can make uh, clean energy local, right? Um, but also addressing one of the, the onslaughts too right now in our communities is the false, whole false solutions or the greenwashing. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to talk about community choice, but I'm not, um, this is not about like what community choice necessarily is. I want to get more into how we're using community choice as an opportunity to do this kind of work, okay? Okay, so community choice energy, we see it as a platform for community benefits. Um, so we're gonna focus on that. So where do our communities get our electricity from and why does it matter? It matters because um, you know, of affordability. It matters because a lot of us don't have choices, right? About where our energy comes from. Um, and oftentimes we really don't know, right? where our energy comes from. Um, and it also matters because it matters, energy matters to our communities, right? That's what we use all the time and that's what we're using now. So who decides where our electricity comes from? Well, if you live in the East Bay area, the Bay Area, your electricity um, is determined by this corporation, PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric. <laughs> Um, and, and we hiss, why? Because what do we know PG&E to do? Yeah, so there's a lot of reasons, right? Um, I also worked on the PG&E Hunters Point Power Plant in San Francisco. So just as an organizer, I've been working with communities whose health has been compromised because of corporate pollution, right? Um, and so in here, we got PG&E. Also, if you've seen the Aaron Brockovich movie, you've also heard about how PG&E um, lied to people about their pollution to the drinking water there um, in that community. Okay, so what this means is a lot more pollution in our communities. Um, you know, I've been uh, an environmental justice, climate justice organizer for way too long. <laughs> but um, uh, pretty much when I was learning about environmental racism and justice, we were also being trained to understand that our f local fights at home also are fighting climate change on a global level and that the impacts and the reduction of pollution we can do at home actually it, uh, affects the rest of the world, right? And understanding that, um, you know, poor people around the world are, are the first hit and the worst hit, right? When it comes to climate catastrophe, we're seeing all that now more than ever. Um, and it's really, it's really appalling to see the way 
communities, to see the way poor people, to see the way communities of color immigrants are being treated right now in crisis where our government can't get it together. The rich, one of the richest governments in the world can't get it together um, to take care of, of its own people here in the United States, but also, you know, we've impacted a lot of these island uh, communities and, and it's, it's, yeah, so going back to uh, fighting climate change and fighting pollution here at home, it really, it really is the work of, um, work for climate justice, I would say. So California's response to climate change, um, you might be aware that there are state mandates um, that utilities are required to sell a certain percentage or 50% of renewable energy by 2030. Um, and so that's one of the things that we, one of the things we have to meet as a state, right? So what they do is they actually um, contract for electricity from big renewable power plants in the desert. So this is a model that we, we currently have right now that is not necessarily the best model. Um, one of the things that I hear a lot about is that um, we're constantly told like that desert communities don't have people. Um, and so therefore it's okay to build these huge solar farms, we call them, right? But there actually are communities that live in the desert. There are ecosystems that are destroyed and impacted. Um, so just to acknowledge that. Also, it's not sustainable to be producing energy far away and then transmitting in, in locally. It's just not a sustainable model, just like when you talk about agriculture, right? It's the same kind of thing. Um, they destroy fragile desert ecosystems. So again, going back to they require long, costly transmission lines. So the question is, who pays for all of this? Who pays for this infrastructure? Any Rate ideas? Payers. Rate payers? Yeah. We obviously do. And who benefits from this infrastructure? pg e does. The corporations do, right? OK. So community choice, there is an alternative. How many of you in this room have heard of community choice before, today, before you looked at your pamphlet? OK, <laughs> great. Um, so what, what's good about community choice is that's an opportunity for us to decide where our electricity comes from. Um, and one of the things to note is um, in California, the policy, the statewide policy was AB 117 that passed back in 2002. When did Marin Clean Energy get off the ground, the very first community choice program? Do you know we what year? We started serving customers in 2010. In 2010, so there's a huge gap of time. And part of that is because corporations like PG&E have been fighting community choice tooth and nail in every which way they can. At the statewide level, they've even gone as far as to fight us at the local level, right? They've spent about at least thirty-five million dollars. Yes, and I've heard that there is a whole new bill. They're sneaking things, and and um, there's a, another bill that doesn't yeah. even have a number yet. Yeah, that is. Care yeah, the so we're about to find out what that's about. Okay. So community choice. Um, so how it's structured. So this is just an example of the investor-owned utility or the PG&E model, where they they procure the power. They own and maintain that transmission line infrastructure. They provide the customer service billing, right? But then you might have heard of public power, and a fine example of a local public power would be like Alameda Municipal Power. Um, and they, their, so their structure for public power is that the government procures their power, the government owns and maintains the transmission lines, and they also produce the, um, the customer service billing, right? Well, in community choice, we refer to it as a hybrid system, meaning that we're creating a community energy authority, so it's made up of electeds. Um, we procure our power, we set our rates for the power, um, and all of them are competitive with the IOU, whatever the investor-owned utility charges. Um, and we design our programs and what benefits come out of our programs. So it's a hybrid system. So what that is just showing here is that 
Um, because it is a hybrid system, PG&E owns the, the transmission lines and they also provide the customer service billing. <laughs> but your local government that's starting a community choice program, they get to decide where the energy comes from. This is just another visual for how it works, right? Um, but we like to include community. The obvious is always left out. What's most important is always left out, right? It's community organizing, so our public board. Um, and I'm focused primarily in the East Bay, so our program is called East Bay Community Energy. Um, so it's made up of uh, 12 different electeds. Um, so there's two cities that are not participating in it because a lot of their electeds are very conservative. Um, and they don't like the power that bigger cities like Oakland and Hayward have and Berkeley and they want nothing to do with Oakland Berkeley and so we're like okay then don't join um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's uh, Newark and Pleasanton okay. people Not are trying hard. to get people are trying to get Pleasanton to join yeah. they might later um, so so anyways, this is just another diagram to show how it works. Uh, PG&E, again, they own that infrastructure and they provide the billing. So one of the things that um, you might have noticed in the last couple years is that community choice programs are starting to pop up in different parts of the state of California. Um, and so one of the things that's noting is that probably over in the next five years, more than half of the state will be getting their electricity from a community choice program. So that's just what that um, is illustrating. So this is the program that we've been um, organizing around. It's the East Bay Community Energy and that's their tagline, the power to choose. So that's all of Alameda except for those two communities um, and except for the city of Alameda because they have their own public power um, program already. Really green one too. Yeah. And, and that's an example is of when, you're, when you have a small community, you can do so much more, right? <laughs> In comparison to trying to do something on a county level or a statewide level, it's just a lot more complicated. Okay, so this is just our timeline. Um, we've been pretty much organizing for years to get a community choice program. We're supposed to have our program launch in spring of 2017, but we're always not meeting our own deadlines for a lot of different reasons. Um, so just to let you know that where our program is not going to start until next year. Um, so if it wasn't clear what community choice is, I'd like for that to be homework tonight where you can go and find out more about what community choice is. I want to get into more about our vision and what we're focusing on out of community choice. Um, so we can, you can ask questions more um, afterwards, but if we run out of time for whatever reason they want us to go, then, um, then you can read more about community choice. Okay, so what is our vision? So our vision and our focus is to put the community in community choice energy. So a lot of community choice programs are very heavily um, put together by electeds um, and there's not very much community engagement, engagement with the people that actually live in the community. So that's one of the things that we've been heavily focused on is just really organizing around community choice. So we can choose where our electricity comes from. So one of the, the criticisms we have of community choice is that the way all community choice programs are mostly structured is to just buy energy off the market. And the reason people say is because, well, the market's cheap and we should lock in contracts. Um, but that's not the clean energy future we want to see where you're just buying energy on the market because then you're not doing anything better than what PG&E or any of these other corporations are doing, right? Um, and the reasons against the market is because the market is unstable, um, there's price volatil volatility, and there's also no guarantee of actual reduction of greenhouse gas, that pollution that causes climate change, right? Um, so the, what we're trying to do is really emphasize um, local renewables through community choice energy. And the reason for that is because it, the prices would be more stable. Um, there's more economic development, creation of jobs. 
um, and as well as you would actually be reducing local greenhouse gases, right? It's more tangible. Community choice means that we could develop clean energy resources right in our community, and so that's just an example of rooftop solar Oakland in the Oakland Athletic Club. And the economic development, the creation of good local jobs. Um, so one of the things at the time I was organizing out here in Richmond and fighting um, the pollution from the refinery and the refinery expansion is a lot of training programs started popping up, teaching people how to do install solar. Um, but one of the things that was problematic is there weren't a lot of jobs at the end of those training programs. So really trying to push the envelope further and actually create those opportunities so that people who train for that sector actually have a job at the end of completion of their training, right? So who benefits from community choice energy? Ratepayers, workers, unions, local businesses, residents, renters, educators, trainers, property owners, public service people, everybody benefits from community choice energy. So this is a, a diagram that I put together to kind of show our vision. Um, and so you'll see we have the engagement. So one of the things we advocated for um, through our community choice program with our electeds was to get a local, uh, local build out plan. Um, and what that is is to figure out where in the community we could actually place solar or wind projects, for example, um, and actually look at all the communities in Alameda County and think about where we can do this. Um, and that includes things like energy efficiency as well, um, but where we can actually put solar and wind projects, right? Um, and so this drop down kind of shows that we would be integrating our local clean energy with the market resources. So our thought is that in the plan over the next 10 years, we can begin integrating more local clean energy and start weaning off of the market little by little. So that's the, the, the thought behind that. Um, and just acknowledge that there will be a lot of new local uh, generation of clean energy. Um, and then demand reduction is just kind of a fancy word for conservation um, and actually reduce our actual consumption, right? Um, so integrating that into our program, energy efficiency, there's all kinds of things that um, new technology, right? So like there's a lot of talk about storage. Um, that's something that's really expensive right now, but it's projected to actually be more affordable later on, maybe 10 years from now, who knows? Um, I'm sorry, or maybe less than 10 years? Hopefully, hopefully, yeah. So one of the things that, um, again, we want to acknowledge that we want to be able to create more employment pathways so that people who do those training programs actually have, um, or workforce development training actually have those opportunities to get those jobs. Um, start, starting to think about what kind of incentive programs we can offer people. Um, and then, you know, there's opportunities and incentive programs for people that actually do, you know, their own solar on their roof. Um, so you got to think about there's municipal buildings, right, your government buildings, your libraries, etc. There's warehouses, the industry, right, and those are rooftops too. There's also, um, you know, our homes, our schools, etc. Um, so there's different sizes of, of solar opportunities. Um, and what's neat about Community Choice is that they mostly call it Community Choice aggregation. I don't know if you're familiar with that word. But I see that as pooling different projects of different sizes and looking at it, at it as one. And that creates an opportunity to actually um, create more permanent work and actually possibility for unionizing some of the work through project labor agreements. So that's another opportunity through community choice because we're looking at an entire county, right? So think about rooftops countywide. That's a huge project. And in order to unionize solar, you have to have a certain amount of megawatts for it to qualify for it to be unionized. Um, and one of the criticisms right now of solar jobs is that they're temporary or they're low wage pay. 
Um, and so that's something we need to change, right? But that's not true of community choice. No, just in general. Yeah. Just in because, general. Because in general. Is prevailing wage right. is, is always important. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, just saying that in general, like, you know, some of the criticisms is that the, the wages are like, you know, not even $20 sometimes, you know. Um, so just to acknowledge that that's where we're at now and we want to change that. Um, so you see the purple arrows on the side. That's just to demonstrate that if we can do all these, put all these pieces into play within community choice, we would be uh, winning environmental justice, winning economic justice, and at the same time exercising our energy democracy, right? Because right now, that's the model we have for our energy is not participatory at all. <laughs> it's imposed on us, if anything. Um, next slide. Um, so one of the things that we do in our organizing is we host these um, kind of town hall meetings, workshops. Um, I, they're kind of like brainstorm sessions. They're all called Clean Power to the People, and they have different themes. Um, but this one was um, kind of where we did like a fishbowl discussion where we would ask a question about jobs, training, you know, what do we need, and we get all the workforce development people um, who work in wor workforce development kind of training groups and ask them questions, well, what do we need to retain, um, you know, people in these training programs and then, you know, we need jobs. And actually there's a housing crisis right now. A lot of these actual training, training facilities have to provide housing in order to retain their trainees. Um, so just really basic things came out of, you know, a lot of these discussions and just looking at everything more holistically, like the issues in our community more holistically, and trying to figure out how we can um, approach these problems and, and propose more solutions through um, the community choice programs. Um, so I'm gonna go down a list of our goals um, within the program. The first goal is inclus inclusiveness of community representation. So initially we were advocating to actually have community people, stakeholders on the board with the electeds. We weren't able to get that. We actually got a community advisory committee and they, they allowed uh, one person from that community body to sit on the board with the rest of the electeds. Um, so that's actually, that's something that was put into place um, just this early this summer. So we're just getting it off the ground. Um, but we wanted to ensure that we had a place for community to engage and actually um, um, advocate for what we want to see within the program. So that was the very first goal. Yeah. Competitively priced electricity. Everybody who's starting Community Choice says, we want cheap rates, we want cheap rates. And it's like, yeah, we want cheap rates too, but there's so much more we want out of this program. So just to, to acknowledge that every Community Choice program that's off the ground, their rates are way cheaper than whatever their um, co corporation was prior to them. The third goal is beating California and pg es renewable portfolio standard. So doing better and adding more, um, more renewable projects than the state and the corporation mandates. So number four is prioritizing local renewables. Um, the local development business plans, possible target could be 50% local renewables within the, within 10 years. Um, so that's just an example of what it could be. Um, so the fifth goal is family sustaining union jobs with justice, local workforce development. Um, the racial equity piece, again, going acknowledging that a lot of people who've recently been trained are in communities of color, but there aren't enough jobs in that sector. And so what we want to do is really emphasize there's a need for a lot more clean energy jobs. Um, and actually including a lot of small, local, diverse, and cooperative businesses um, and creating more cooperative businesses. Um, so we engage a lot of people who are in these different um, sectors and so that they can have more opportunities within the community choice program. So the sixth goal is community ownership and control of renewable resources for the equitable economic development, 
the strengthened resilience in low-income communities and communities of color, which are the communities that don't, at the, with our current structure, don't have access to clean energy um, and therefore don't benefit at this moment. So we're trying to change that, right? And number seven is improving health and safety, health and safety for the community, fence line communities by oil refineries, for example, um, but also the workers. The workers are the first to be affected if there's an explosion like there was here at Chevron in 2012. Um, so just acknowledging that we want to improve, you know, the safety for the, for the workers, for the community. Um, and actually, you know, um, if you are <laughs> producing a lot more jobs in the community, that's another criticism of Chevron. The majority of people who work at Chevron do not in Richmond. And, and a lot of, of what Chevron's executives and PR people would say is that once they hire people from Richmond, they move out. And then my response to that would always be, yeah, if you know what they're doing on a, a daily basis at the refinery, you'd want to get the hell out of Richmond. <laughs> because you're vulnerable to, to um, any explosion or any kind of impact. You know, um, yeah, so improving the health and safety of our communities. So, so community choice is our path to solutions for climate resiliency, for community control, and the creation of good local jobs. So, um, so I'm going to get into a little bit of like how in, in Alameda County. So I work for the local Clean Energy Alliance, but what we do is we create a lot of different alliances to go with our campaigns. Um, Prior to Alameda County committing to start a community choice program, we were advocating just to get a community choice program off the ground. There were efforts to get the city of Oakland to start community choice. There were efforts to get East Bay Mud to start a community choice program. Those, those uh, campaigns, we, didn't, we were not successful. But when we finally got the Board of Supervisors of the County of Alameda to agree, then we created a, an, an Alameda County-wide alliance, and that's called the East Bay Clean Power Alliance. So I've been the coordinator ever since um, uh, actually the beginning of 2015. So um, our former Clean Energy Jobs Oakland alliance kind of merged and we broadened out. So. One of the things that I've been heavily focused on is just really um, including a lot of different allies in the community. Um, so when we were actually having our hearings to get the supervisors to commit um, to having community representation in the program and actually committing to local build out of clean energy, um, we had a lot of folks come out and support us. Um, different labor representation, the California Nurses Association, because they want to see, you know, health improve in the community. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers 595, the president spoke at one of our um, rallies, press conferences, um, as well as testified. Um, and then this person from Physicians for Social Responsibility, um, the California Interfaith Power and Light, um, and then various environmental justice, housing justice, and different social justice leaders in the communities. Um, so going back to the engagement and representation, um, a lot of my work has been really focused. This specific photo comes from an event that we exclusively were like, we're intentionally engaging people of color in the community for this specific, not, and that didn't mean there were no white people in the room, there was, but I think there was like three or something like that. Um, so just really engaging people of color, low income people to talk about community choice in the way we wanna see it and how it would benefit our community. Um, and we're holding a clean energy and jobs banner um, and this is like, I always say, this is for historical purposes because it's not Oakland anymore. It's all of Alameda County. Um, so again, we build alliances with um, different leaders in the community. We had signed on almost 60 organizations in Alameda County. Um, so that was very important. All our camp campaign update events were all called Clean Power to the People. Um, and a lot of my work has really been to to include people of color, but even in, in the clean energy sector, it's, I'm sorry, it's mostly white men, older white men, 
And so we always have to advocate just to have women on a lot of these boards and decision-making bodies. The board for the whole program has one woman on it. Um, out of 12 electeds, there's only one woman, the representative of Emeryville. Emeryville. There are, um, City of Berkeley's alternate is a woman. Um, and our chair for the community advisory committee who sits on the board with the electeds is a woman. We had to fight to get her on there because they wanted to get some technical union guy. Um, and they were arguing, well, he's technical. He understands what's going on. I was pissed. I was like, women understand what's going on here, OK? Um, so we, we had to fight. We had to fight. Who's the woman on the board? Who's, who's the representative of the community? Uh, her name is Anne Olivia Aldred, and she's with the California Nurses Association. Awesome. And she's an organizer yeah. for, the, for CNA. Um, so. And as much as people said she wouldn't understand what's going on, she's handling it. She is handling it. So I'm very, very happy. I was very agitated, but I'm very happy she's showing them out. Local Clean Energy Alliance, that's who I work for. Um, and this is just photos from different events. I think we were tabling at an Earth Day in Oakland. Um, there and this was one of the clean power to the people um, events where we were talking about the goals laying out the goals and why they were important in our community um, and that's just an image I created so that we can put it on a t-shirt <laughs> and we use um, the hashtag clean power to the people on our Twitter on our Facebook um, and we encourage more people to Think of ways that you can advocate for clean power for all people, for renters, for people of color, so that all people can benefit from clean energy. Um, and feel free to use that hashtag as well. Um, one of our side projects, just to add, is that um, we're actually trying to put together a shared solar mm -hmm. project. Um, and so we're kind of using it. It'll be a pilot project. We're trying to create more projects that we could use as an example that's more tangible about of what we want to see more in our community, um, but also how it would be connected to a program like a community choice program and sell its excess uh, energy back into the local community as opposed to that structure of bringing in energy from far away. So that's me and my coworker Megan. She's the one who's spearheading the shared solar pro project. Um, that's my contact information. Um, I do have some handouts to share with you. If you didn't get them, please let me or Ange Angela know. Thank you, guys.